And our next presenter is Emma Kate Matthews, who will be talking to us about composing for extreme spaces. I'm Emma Kate. Uh, I'm an architect. Um, I'm also a composer and a researcher. And I'm currently studying and teaching at University College London. Um, and I'm generously supported by the London Arts and Humanities Partnership. Um, my research is concerned with the discovery and exploitation of creative reciprocities between music as constructed sound and architecture as constructed space. And one of the ways that I'm exploring this is through the composition of site-specific pieces of music for performance in buildings and spaces such as the Sagrada Familia, which is what I'm going to focus on today. You'll hear me use the word spatiosonic, which is a, a self-coined term that I use to refer to interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work amongst the interconnected fields of architecture, acoustic engineering, music composition and performance. And this practice-based paper that I'll discuss today um, discusses a number of methods for working with the opportunities and challenges faced when composing music intended for live performance in spaces with extreme and highly particular acoustic characteristics. So this, this research questions the responsibility of architecture in relation to musical performance at a time actually when concert hall design is becoming increasingly standardized as a result of a design trend towards acoustic certainty and, and almost away from acoustic diversity. And in this paper, architecture is examined as an active component of music composition and performance, as opposed to a mere container for such events. And as, as I said, today's presentation will place a particular focus on a project that I composed and performed in 2017 in collaboration with professors Jim Barber, Jane Burry and Mark Burry from the University of Swinburne in Australia. And this, this particular project was generously funded by the Australian Research Council. So this composition exploits the extreme acoustic characteristics of the extraordinarily reverberant interior at Gaudi's Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And the Sagrada Familia's 12 second reverberation time has proven to be highly problematic for achieving speech intelligibility in the delivery of spoken word sermons. And quite a few engineers and designers have previously attempted to fix this problem by proposing to retrofit acoustically absorbent surfaces or change the internal uh, geometry of the space with um, sort of temporary structures. However, this composition that I made um, takes full advantage of this unique condition by locating musicians in spatially diverse positions around the space, whilst also employing the building's excessive reverb to blend their soloistic parts into a series of tonally undulating and spatially immersive harmonic events. So a little bit of um, historic context. Historically, we know that architectural space has played a highly active role in influencing the experience and composition of music as evidenced in the spatialized choirs of Dutch Renaissance composer, Adrian Willert. And, Conversely, architects and engineers have long acknowledged the desires of music in sound and space. And many of us are familiar with the notion of the Vitruvian vessels or these pots that were supposedly embedded in the wall as an attempt to improve the acoustics of theatres and performance spaces. But despite these historic examples, actually currently only a, a small handful of practitioners have managed to rigorous, rigorously explore creative interactive parallels between music and architectural space in their work. And uh, 20th century American composer Henry Brandt, who's pictured here, produced quite a few spatialized compositions, which explored the idea that aspects of physical space, particularly distance and direction, can be as compositionally active as other explicitly musical elements, such as tone and timbre. And architecture, acoustical engineering, and music composition and performance all present methods for controlling interactions between sound and space, whether these interactions are explicitly and deliberately calculated in advance, or whether they emerge as a consequence of speculation and experimentation. However, currently in each of these practices, it's common to place a very strong reliance on highly reductive abstractions and representations of these interactions in order to, to um, anticipate record and recall spatiosonic work. Um, so many of you are probably already familiar with the formula that physicist uh, Wallace Clement Sabine developed in the 1860s, which predicts the time it takes for sound to decay in, in a space. And this is based on room volume, surface area, and absorption coefficient of materials which constitute the room. And 
as one of the most conceptually accessible aspects of acoustic phenomena, the calculation of reverberation time has become a, a central focus in the, in the practice of architectural acoustics and as such a key parameter in the design of spaces for music. But the problem with this is that the, the privileging of such a reductive abstraction of the way that sound and space interact seems to have also driven a desire to determine sort of standard targets for reverb times. And perhaps from the sort of architectural perspective, um, this is perhaps to reassure clients and, and other designers that their spaces will sound good for music, which is a slightly problematic generic idea that, that somehow expected to work for all music, past, present and future. And as such, uh, spaces that are, are dedicated to hosting musical performance are most often governed by these acoustic standards, which are really carefully questioned outside of what's quickly becoming a set of conventional expectations. And even though the, the resultant uh, you know, concert halls are, are generally able to host a, a reasonably wide range of types of music, the attitude that this design methodology fosters largely results in, a, in quite a disconnect between the practices of music composition and performance and the design of spaces for music. So these, these are two worlds which used to enjoy a tremendously rich exchange, albeit a sort of less explicitly measurable one, um, before their relationships were diagrammatized and standardized. And this is obviously by no means a, a new observation and it frustrates many other practitioners and researchers too. Um, and I, I think composers and musicians are also partly to blame for this continuing disconnect as architecture is only very rarely seriously interrogated as anything other than a, a container for music as opposed to its potential to be considered as a compositional element. So to focus on the Sagrada Familia project, uh, this project provided me with an opportunity to challenge the role of architecture in music composition from the point of view of both an architect and composer. And for this site-specific duet written for violin and cello, uh, I use tools that are typically employed by architects and engineers in the design of spaces. I, I use these tools as tools for rehearsing compositional musical ideas, particularly for predicting the effect of the, the positioning of musicians around the space and for understanding which frequencies or instrumental ranges were particularly reflective in the space. And the Sagrada Familia is possibly the most acoustically reflective space that I have I have ever and will ever work with. So in this case, it's, it's rather convenient that most of these tools that I'm, that I'm talking about um, for modeling acoustic behavior focus on reflected sound as opposed to other sonic behaviors. So um, despite my sort of distant memories of a previous touristic visit to the Sagrada Familia several years prior to this project, I wasn't actually able to, to get back to the site to physically double check the sound of the space before starting the composition. And as a result, I was only able to simulate and imagine ways in which the sound that I was composing would eventually interact with the space in the eventual performance. And this, this enabled me to make educated guesses as to how rhythmic, melodic and harmonic ideas would unfold throughout the performance relative to the, the dimensional organization of the musicians in the space and the acoustic response of this highly distinctive interior. So to simulate the sound, uh, to simulate the effect of the, the musicians' positions about the space, I used um, the, a place called the Sound Space at uh, an engineering practice called Max Fordham. And this was developed by acoustician Pedro Novo. And this is essentially a, a spherical array of speakers. Some of them are, are hidden in the floor in the ceiling and it's able to position sounds in space relative to the listener who sits in the center. And this enabled me to carefully consider how to choreograph the positions of, of the musicians in advance of what ended up being a very short visit to, to perform and record the piece. Um, and in addition to these sort of physical simulations, I also created a number of digital models to, to compare um, the, the sort of difference in types of simulations with I was using software such as uh, Pachyderm for Rhino, Ear Acoustic for Blender and Cat Acoustic. And um, these make ray traced geometric acoustic models, which then generate impulse response files, um, which gives a sort of frequency dependent impression or acoustic representation. And, and this gave me a, quite a ballpark idea of what to expect from the acoustic response when I convolved these um, these impulse response files with the, the dry recordings and with MIDI exports. 
So, I mean, these, these methods were undoubtedly useful for giving me this ballpark impression of something that's otherwise very difficult to capture and define. However, the, the results of this convolution reverb exercise are perhaps equivalent to a sort of an architectural render or a physical model in, in that the results can only ever provide a representation of the sound in the space. And it's definitely not as rich or as complex as the, the reality. And just to sort of acknowledge this a bit further, in an essay titled Space Within Space, Artificial Reverb and the Detachable Echo, um, McGill researcher Jonathan Stern, who wrote this, acknowledges about acoustic simulation that so many things are happening in so many different ways that they can't be calculated or captured by any modern computing device. And I think even though these tools are very sophisticated, they're still, they're still not able to to capture the, the sort of richness of the reality. So when, when using these tools, either for designing spaces or composing music, we, we need to remember that sound doesn't always neatly travel in straight lines and many simulation tools don't account for complex wave behavior or the visual verification that we get when we're in the actual space. Um, so this, again, this project presented an opportunity for me to both use and critique these tools from, from two different perspectives. Um, and also, as a sort of a trained architect, visualizations of things are, are very useful uh, to my methodology. So visualizations of these ray tracing models, this, this ones are from Pachyderm, um, these prov proved useful for geometrically spotting areas where reflections might become particularly intense. Um, and the, I also use spectral frequency displays to, to provide verification as to which frequencies the space is particularly reflective to. And importantly, how the acoustic response might be affected by the specific positions of the, music, uh, the musicians relative to the listener, where architectural materials and geometry may vary between positions. Um, so EA for Blender, the, one of the other tools, sadly no longer supported, but it's perhaps, and it's perhaps the least accurate in terms of its ability to replicate the sound of the space, but it was still very useful in, in what was quite, ended up quite a sculptural process of virtually quickly moving musicians around to get a, a kind of a, an acoustic sketch uh, to get the right sort of sound, even though I had to accept that it was going to be probably quite different to the, to the real thing. Um, but having that sort of fast feedback was was really key to that part of the process. And the, the spectral frequency displays also provide further verification of what I was hearing. So um, especially with the regards with regard to the behavior of re reflected overtones, because sometimes it sounded like some of the overtones or or partials were being reflected for longer than the fundamentals. And I'll, I'll play an example of this later. Um, so the to go back to the conceptual focus of the project, it attempts to elevate architecture to become, as I said before, not just a container for sound, but a compositional tool in itself on the same level as, as aspects of musical tone, timbre and rhythm, and therefore capable of rendering or transforming a musical idea. So I hypothesized that this, this composition called Construction 2 would be a different piece when it's played in an, in an extremely acoustically dry location, such as an anechoic chamber, compared to when it's played in the extremely reverberant setting of the Sagrada Familia. So conceptually, this raises some pretty big questions as to what constitutes a, a piece, because it, it could be argued, uh, I realise this may be opening a bit of a can of worms, but it could be argued that any musical idea that possesses a, an amount of portability will maintain its integrity no matter who's playing it and where it's played. Maybe there's not time to go into this in, in much detail today, but if we if we conceptualize the score for construction two as the facilitator of a site-specific musical event as opposed to a, a musical thing that ignores the specifics of its physical environment, then it's I, I think it's reasonable to suggest that the architectural construction in which the musical event takes place can be considered as compositionally important as the other um the other musical aspects like tone, timbre and rhythm. So in order to, to test this theory in the context of this project, the piece was also performed in a, another extreme acoustic space in the form of a very small and extremely absorbent anechoic chamber where the room provided absolutely no acoustic response. And from this space, we gained a, a super dry recording which provided a useful comparison to the incredibly 
reverberant recording that we made at the Sagrada Familia. Um, so here's a, I'm just going to do a quick sort of A to B comparison of the difference. So this is the, the dry recording. <laughs> And this is the recording in the Sagrada. Oops, sorry. So again, as, as well as hearing the difference, you can also see on the spectrogram and the waveform visualization that compares these two recordings. Um, as you heard in the opening bars, the, the piece contains a number of sharp stabs which get muted and then um, and the, that stab is allowed to ring out in the Sagrada Familia um, in a way that it obviously doesn't in the anechoic chamber. Um, so the, the, there are moments in the music where the space is allowed to assert its, its acoustic opinions and the building is, is helping to blend notes and sort of construct a harmonic idea. <laughs> And so apart from the more obvious transformation of short unreflected sounds into elongated reflected ones, there are also some subtle differences in the presence of um, overtones and the ability to achieve harmonics. So in the anechoic chamber, our, our cellist Theo was most disturbed to realize that he wasn't actually able to achieve harmonics as easily as when he's in a normal room with, with even minimal reflections. And at first he sort of panicked and thought he'd somehow forgotten how to play, but after some some gentle counselling and, and a discussion, we decided that actually the anechoic chamber was simply not feeding the cello with an amount of reflection that's necessary for exciting the instrument and producing and sustaining harmonics. But it, by contrast, in the Sagrada Familia, the same harmonics were apparently easy peasy to achieve. Um, and then a, a more subtle observation of, in the presence of these um, overtones and partials when they either get reflected or, or disappear. So in in the Sagrada Familia performances after the initial attack of some of the more frequency rich notes, so usually those played on, on open strings, um, it sounded like some of the higher frequency overtones were disappearing quite quickly, but some of the mid to low frequency ones were still bouncing around after even the fundamental had stopped. Um, so again, I was sort of, we were all checking our ears on this one, thinking, is, can that be possible? And, and looking, using the spectrogram to verify what we were hearing. Um, so I'm just going to play you um, quickly the, the first stab. Um, and you can hear that there's a, the, the note that continues is a, it sounds like a G, but the other frequencies sort of tail off quite fast. So I'll just play this so you can hear it. So, um, oops, sorry. So the the note that you can sort of that that appears to be the note that drones. I'll just play it again after the stab. So um, this this was quite exciting, as you can imagine, <laughs> and to to sort of unpack or attempt to unpack what we're hearing in those stabs. Um, the, the cello is playing a, a low C sharp, not quite an open string, but nearly, and that emits a fundamental tone of around 69 hertz. But the overtones between 100 and 400 hertz are also quite rich in this, this low C sharp. And the violin is simultaneously playing a double stop on a, a low G at, I think, 196 hertz on the open string and an F at 350 hertz positioned low down on the, the D string, both of which evolve a long length of vibrating string. Um, and it's similarly rich in overtones around the 400 Hertz mark. So it seems possible that the overtones within this, this frequency band were bouncing around for longer than the higher frequency ones because of the uh, acoustic potential of the space in terms of its material absorption or lack of, and the immense spatial volume, but also, um, perhaps due to some of the large distances that, that are present between the interior surfaces. And you know, such reflective behavior, I mean, these weren't picked up in the simulations, but this um, creates some rather delightful tonal ambiguities in parts of the music, which were unexpected at the time of composition. And it's, it just got me very excited. It's a very fun thing to work with this as a compositional element and one which is of, of course, very, very site specific. Um, so 
just I, I know I mentioned uh, coming to the end of my my talk now, but um, I mentioned another highly site specific project in the title that I'm currently working on this at the moment. Unfortunately, it's experienced a few delays due to COVID, but uh, similarly takes advantage of a unique acoustic condition. And this is um, it's a collaboration with opera director Rosie Parker and filmmaker Leanne van den Buscher. And we're working on a site specific opera designed for the Mosley Road Edwardian Bathhouse in Birmingham. And in this project, uh, the dramaturgical delivery of the opera's script relies on the repetition of verbal content to create intense moments of unintelligible vocal overlaps. And in, in this particular spot, the repetition is achieved by taking advantage of the natural acoustic reflectivity of the interior of the bathhouse, including water um, when that, that pool is full. So this is learning from the methodologies and outcomes of the Sagrada Familia project. Um, so I'm just gonna, I, I realize I'm sort of running out of time, but I'm just gonna quickly um, explain the positions of the musicians in the Sagrada Familia um, as tested out in the digital model. So we we placed the Jim Barber placed a an ambisonic microphone next to the altar, which which was um, the position of the recording, but it was also the position where the impulse response files were generated for the simulation. So um, firstly, we tried the cello and the violin around 10 meters apart horizontally and 17 meters in the air on a balcony. Then we stayed at 17 meters in the air and um, push the musicians 50 meters apart on separate balconies. Then we went down to the ground floor where the cello stayed close to the altar and the violin was all the way back towards the other end of the nave. And then we tried a, a slightly more sensible position uh, on the ground floor where the cello and violin were opposite each other and not very far apart. Um, and then finally we separated them again. So this was the most extreme position. They were 20 meters in the air at this point and over 60 meters apart. Um, so in addition to, to the space reflecting the sound in interesting ways, it was also affecting the musicians, particularly when the distances between them are larger. So for instance, the tempo that we heard in the Sagrada Familia at the most extreme position was noticeably slower than the, in the anechoic chamber. And in this comparison, you can see that the anechoic chamber at, um, at 80 beats per minute should be finishing at just before five minutes, but it finishes roughly uh, you know, six minutes, 20 seconds, meaning they were playing closer to 60 beats per minute. Um, and just, just to finish, um, I'm gonna play you a couple, a few seconds of, of examples just to compare. So um, the, in this one, we're hearing the first two sounds that you hear are the uh, two different types of simulation. And the last one that you hear will be the actual sound. So this is, this is one of the ray trace simulations. This is the convolution reverb simulation. Oops, sorry. And this one is the, the real thing. So you can hear that they're all actually quite different. <laughs> Um, and then the last slide I have is just comparing the, the, these are real recordings, but from the different positions. So this is where they were up on the balcony, but quite a, quite a distance from the microphone. And this is where they were down on the ground floor, but close to the microphone. And this is the most extreme position where they were up in the air and um, nearly 70 meters apart. So um, that's, that's all I have time for today, but thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch and um, you can hear more on my website.